<laughs> what if this is just the introduction? <laughs> just us coughing. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to what is technically the second, but can also kind of be construed to be the first episode, or the 80th, or whatever the fuck we're on, episode of Sickle and Hammer Time, which is the new name that we have for this podcast show thing. Um, the last episode that we did, if you look on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you may be now, um, you, you will see that there are two episodes. There's this one, and then there's the last one. And the last one is kind of the last episode of Shit Island, and sort of the first episode of Sickle and Hammer Time. It's confusing, and that's why we've decided to talk about the whole thing at the start of this episode. I'm joined today, as always, um, by my co-host, Peter Rhodes. Hello, everyone. Yes, this is all very confusing, but rest assured that uh, it's a, a thing that's happened. Yes, it sure is a thing. <laughs> so, as far as I remember, we discussed changing the name a while back, and then we put it up yeah. to the patrons of the old podcast and your YouTube channel, uh, we came up with a few names, and then they voted on which name they thought that we should change our uh, podcast into. I don't even remember the other ones, wasn't it? I think it was between Sickle and Hammer Time, yeah. This Soviet, this Soviet life. life. Yeah. yeah. And what was the third one? It was... Uh, Rycast. As well. Oh, yeah. Rycast, yeah, because yeah. of uh, Scandinavia and yeah. Rye Bread. We were actually going to go for that one, but then I found out there's another podcast which is called Rycast, which is by some university. So. Yeah, that was unfortunate because I like that one a lot. But I mean, this mm. is I mean this this is a, a, a good name too, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it is also just a name, and I don't think yeah. it really matters all that much. No, uh, what no. matters is the content and the souls of you and I, and us getting on iTunes. Yes, that too. We're on, we're on iTunes now for the first time. We didn't, we weren't able to get on iTunes before because we had the word shit in our last podcast name. Our last yeah. podcast, for those of you who may be new to us and haven't ever listened to us before, we used to have a podcast called Shit Island, which was basically the exact same thing that we're doing now, except under a different name, and we couldn't get it on iTunes because iTunes doesn't allow podcasts with the word shit in the title yeah and you can still listen to those old episodes we have some great ones in there i think we have a good interview with uh sabrina abelina yeah and, and american johnson we had two episodes with him yeah really good really good stuff love to have him yeah. back sometime we're yeah we'll look into that i'll 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 have my people call his people good good my secretary's really busy with all the lunch meetings i'm taking so mm -hmm. yeah I'm meeting up with a business mogul this, this afternoon. Yeah, the CEO of communism, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> who, who is the CEO of communism, would you say? Oh, that's a great question. If communism was a corporation, who would be the CEO? <laughs> um, Barack Obama, probably. Yeah, that's a good one. Hillary yeah. Clinton would be the CFO. Definitely the CFO, the financial officer would be <laughs> Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> yeah. The secretary of the communist state. She's the uh, Molotov of the communist organizations. Yeah. Well, Molotov was the foreign, foreign minister. Wasn't she also the foreign minister of the US? Uh, no, she was, I think she was just the secretary of state. Oh yeah, no, I was I was thinking Benghazi because that's what everyone kept saying about her, like Benghazi, and she was in charge of that whole mess. Yeah, she was involved there somehow. Anyway, anyway, um, who the fuck? Who are you, and who am I? That's a great question. I philosophically, am, I mean, yeah. Speaking of philosophic, who are any of us? What uh, is humanity, oh. and what is our purpose? See, that's yeah. I mean. That's Let's like, start with our names. My name is Asher Scapegoat. Yes, it is. And you're, you're the famous one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're, this is like friends. We're doing a, you're the famous one, I'm the fat one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe um, not the fat one, actually. But the, I don't, you're not fat. No. I'm the Danish one. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah you know, every sitcom has, you know, the famous one and the Danish one. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a Dane. Oh, yeah, always, you know, always. Um, Big Bang Theory has Raj. He's yeah, Danish. he's the Danish. <laughs> It's we just could. that guy. It's it's yeah. the guy who plays Raj and Mess Mikkelsen, who are in every sitcom. That's true. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's famous for his sitcoms, actually. Yeah, obviously, he's he's the sitcom Dane. He's yeah, yeah the guy who falls over a lot. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. gets kicked in the nuts and does the funny face. Yeah, that's that's that guy. <laughs> Mads Mikkelsen starring yeah. in the next Adam Sandler movie. <laughs> He's the Danish Rob Schneider, is who yeah. he is. No, he's a great actor. He's a, he's fun. I, I've seen him drunk a few times in Copenhagen. He's oh, he's a big he's a big nice. fan of the foot the football team, the working class Copenhagen football team Brøndby, which is on the west side of Copenhagen. So he mm-hmm. will go out, get re- very very drunk, uh, smoke like a hundred cigarettes, and stumble home on his bike. I've seen it happen. <laughs> it happens. He's very um. Danish. Uh, yeah, but uh, I guess t- t- for the introductions, Asher, you are a YouTube content creator extraordinaire. Who? Uh, yeah, I haven't made a YouTube video in like a year. <laughs> <laughs> As people keep letting us know, when are you yeah. gonna go back to making real videos? I, I want to, and I'm <laughs> I'm working on one. It just takes a lot of time and effort and go to university and I have work and I have this podcast, which doesn't actually take that up any time at all. But I mean, like pe- people assume it's super easy to just condense all this political theory into easily digestible YouTube format videos that are seven minutes mm. long, but it's really hard. I tried making a video on Kierkegaard just a few weeks back and it turned yeah. into a complete mess. Uh, like and and forty minutes long, and then I was just like, I wouldn't watch this, so I didn't upload it. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, it's it's harder than it looks, folks. And this is I've this is just like this is good. Yeah, like I've I've run into that same thing. I tried. I I was gonna make a video about Epicurus, the ancient Greek philosopher, who I love talking about because I find him so interesting. But like when I had written the script. And I read through it, I was like, this is shit, and so I scrapped it, and then I wrote a new script, and then I read that, and I was like, alright, fine. So I recorded it, listened to it, scrapped that, wrote a new script, recorded that, um, listened to it, I was like, that's fine, and then I tried to make the actual video with the animations and stuff, and then somewhere along the editing process, I was like, this video just is not interesting to anyone but me. (laughs) Yeah, see, that's the thing, yeah. And then I, I'm guessing. I mean, I, I I'm not soup. I'm not super good friends with a lot of YouTube creators or anything. Uh, mm. But the the ones I have talked to have said that if you see, like a lot of the big channels upload maybe one video a month, or yeah, some some of the big ones even just do like one every two months. And you know, if you're if you're just not to demean anyone, but if you're someone who's who sits at home and and watches along, you might think, oh, this person just. Uh, jerked off for two months and then <laughs> <laughs> yeah. wrote a script and recorded something uh, on an afternoon. No, there's there's like a lot of videos that never amount to anything or a lot of wasted work or work that might only materialize after a year or something. So like there's a lot yeah. of work that goes into making even the most rudimentary YouTube videos, unless you're like a, a dedicated production, like uh, uh, what are they called? Like now this or Buzzfeed and stuff. Like those people mm-hmm. have offices and writers and directors and photographers. And, but if you're just oh, yeah. someone who sits and, and makes videos, maybe with one collaborator, it can take a long time to make a, a video that's actually any good. Yeah. And I mean, that's not trying to say that like YouTube is a difficult job and it's like, oh, poor YouTubers. Oh, no, they, no. <laughs> like, like I've worked as a teacher very recently. Um, uh, as part of my my university studies, you go out and you do the you practice working as a teacher for a while, and then you go back to your studies, which is what I'm doing now. And like that is so much more difficult, like so much more exhausting compared to mm. YouTube. Because when you're doing YouTube, yes, it's a lot of work, and you do have to work like like you do have to sit down every day and work on scripts and and work on animations and all of that depending on what kind of video you're still doing but like you can still wake up at like noon if you want 
Yeah. You know, you can't do that as a teacher. When you're a teacher, you wake up at 6 a.m. And that's, my fucking body can't handle that shit. Yeah, I, like, it's that thing of, like, the real world and then entertainment or, like, creative yeah. or academic work. They're two very different things, but they're very exhausting in different ways. I, th I think, like, when you do work that's creative or you're a writer or you're a comedian or an actor, it's more of a thing of you never have any time off. Like, it just absorbs your whole brain and you're constantly thinking even if you're trying to relax, you're constantly like involved in this process of creation. So it's, it's, uh, it's different. I mean, it's, it's, it's a way easier life than working construction. Don't get me wrong, but it's also like a thing that if you're not careful, will drive you crazy. Yeah. And it's also like, yeah, I, th I definitely think going crazy is one of the main dangers. I think that you would drive yourself crazy a lot, but I like, one of the main points of anxiety for me doing something like YouTube, when I was doing YouTube more regularly than I am now, um, like one of the main points of anxiety was, well, what if I just fucking run out of ideas one day? What if tomorrow I wake up and I have like no ideas and then the next day I have no ideas and I just never get another idea for a video ever again? Mm. And then what the fuck am I going to do then? I have a YouTube channel with 25,000 people that want to watch something. I just have no idea what to make for them. Yeah, that's uh, uh, that was thing, something that genuinely made me have anxiety for a while. That's that's like a a, a pretty common line of thinking for people with imposter syndrome, right? Like people who feel like they yes. somehow conned their way into their success. <laughs> yeah, I I definitely have major imposter syndrome. Like whatever mm. it is that I do, like whatever situation I find myself in, I'm always like wow, everyone around me is so good at this thing, and so, like, naturally talented, and I'm just here by accident, somehow. Mm. Like, I felt that way when I got into university and I started talking to people, and I was like, wow, everyone here is so, like, dedicated to their studies, and, and like, they worked hard in high school, but well, when I, like, fucking slacked off, and, mm. <laughs> and, like, oh, everyone here is so, like... Everyone here are, are like students, and I'm not a student. I'm just a guy. I'm just here, <laughs> and like trying to struggle my way through, through every course. And then obviously I realized that, like, first of all, I realized that I was actually doing better than some of my classmates. Which, like, <laughs> it's it sounds dark, but it made me feel better. Like it made my imposter syndrome go away a bit when I realized that, like, oh, I'm actually doing okay compared mm. to some other people. And then. I just also realized that like oh, everyone is struggling basically in the exact same way that I am. Yeah, I think that's really important to remember. I think yeah, some people. I think for me, it's kind of opposite. Like I, I, I've always run into problems thinking that I would be good at whatever I started doing, and then mm. I, as soon as I started doing anything, I would realize that it's actually pretty hard, and then I'd be like, oh man, that's a bummer, and then I kind do, of lose interest. Do you? Um... Do you think that that is like the gifted child syndrome? I think ah, uh, that sounds really uh, that's that sound that sounds really arrogant for me to say, but I think so. I think so. Like I remember. Yeah. I mean, know. I don't think it's arrogant. I think I think it's like a genuine problem where because when I was a kid going through like elementary and middle school, I definitely got praise from my teacher all the time. Like whatever I did. I was like, oh, my teachers always said, oh, you're so gifted, you're so intelligent, you're so smart. Yeah. Even when I like wasn't trying hard. But then when I got to high school, all of a sudden, everyone is gifted and intelligent and smart, just like me. And now is the time when I actually need to put work in. But I haven't learned how to put work in because I have never needed to put work in before because I've always been gifted and talented. Yeah, no, that's definitely my experience as well. Was I, I don't think I really did homework between the third grade and the ninth grade at all in school. Yeah. Because I was just, I found out very quickly that I could get away with not doing homework because I contextually could answer any question that the teacher could come up with in class um, without yeah. having read, studied anything for any classes. So that was actually a huge impairment for me in high school and when I first went to university a long time ago because I had to relearn how to read something, how to do actual academic work. And that was, that was a yeah. bummer because everyone else seemingly 
spent their time in school learning all these techniques for how to read succinctly and quickly and like how to get you know any major points out of a text quickly and i had to teach myself how to do that uh again and that was really tough i remember yeah yeah um because i just didn't read <laughs> i just didn't do anything <laughs> yeah ah, man like i don't I don't have like an official diagnosis or anything because it apparently it's a fuck it's a fucking long story. I've been I've been trying to talk to a bunch of therapists about it, but due to like people pretending to have um ADHD, it's actually really difficult to get a diagnosis with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Because students are constantly like, Oh, I have ADHD, I need thirty minutes extra on the fucking tests or whatever and I want Adderall. Like apparently people have been doing that so much that now Therapists are like skeptical of anyone who says they have ADHD. Yeah, that's a real thing. Yeah, same with depression. Yeah, like it's it get it's getting increasingly hard to get a depression or anxiety diagnosis because they were very yeah. uh, handy with uh, handing them out back in the day. They just didn't. They just yeah. gave that diagnosis to anyone more or less uh, ten years ago. But yeah, so basically, like I have, I have some kind of problem with my attention span, mm -hmm. and so. Like, I've been trained, like, for years now, I've been, like, training myself to learn how to read better and to, like, be able to sit down and just do this one thing. Yeah. Um, but it's it, it's difficult. Like, all, like, I didn't read in high school. Like, I didn't read books in high school. Um, no. Like, at all. And then when I got to university, obviously, all you ever do is you have to read books. Yes. Like, all of a sudden... Like, you start your first course, and your teacher is like, all right, here are the five books you need to read by the end of this week. And yes. you're like, holy shit, I have to read? <laughs> yeah. And so then I was just thrusted into this world where, like, I have to read every day for, for uh, like, at least an hour every day. I have to sit down and I have to read, and I have to actually remember everything as well. Yeah, I have to read three books by next Monday, hmm. and I have not started. But yeah, no, it's actually... it's. <laughs> It's re yeah, it's real. You have to yeah. like you. You can't really weasel your way around it unless you just no. don't want to get any education. Even if even if you do the more hands-on education, you still have to read a lot. You still have to know a lot, and it's especially important if you're doing practical work like carpentry or you know yeah. electronics. You need to know what the different things are because if you do it incorrectly, you're gonna burn the thing you're working on down or wire it incorrectly. So like yeah. yeah. No, that's it's uh, you can't really get around reading so you're kind of cheating yourself by doing it the way we did it i think yeah. but you know it's a process like i've definitely learned to read more and i'm forcing myself to read more every day yeah just to get back into the rhythm of it i have been reading a, a fantastic book called mythologies by edith hamilton recently mm -hmm. that's really good uh yeah it's one of those books that uh a lot of uh, ancient civilization and philosophy students recommend to everyone, but it's really good. It's from the forties. It's about ancient Greece. Um, yeah. that's a really good book. And, uh, Cheeseman, a fantastic Patreon, uh, supporter actually bought me a uh, K-Punk by Mark Fisher for, as a Christmas present. And, um, yeah. you know, thank you so much. That's incredibly kind. And I, I'm not capable with my Danishness to say thank you properly. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very uh, much, Josh. Thank you. That's a, a very sweet thing to do. And I've been reading that these last few days too. So, and that's a fantastic book too. Yeah. So check that out too. I, I watched um, The Witcher, the Netflix series, uh, came out this Christmas, came out like on the 19th or something of December. So I watched that during Christmas. And then after I watched the series, I, because I, I already played The Witcher 3. And. Hmm. I love that game and I love the series. And so then I was like, well, I know that there are novels um, and I need to like, because, because, yeah, I've been reading course literature, like academic text, but which is really boring. And I, I've decided for myself that this year I want to read more f just for fun. Mm -hmm. And so I've started reading um, The Last Wish oh. uh, by Andrzej Sapkowski, the, the famous uh, Polish fantasy author. Oh, and it's a collection of uh, short stories, and it's very good. That's very neat. Yeah, that's a shout out to our Polish sci-fi. Yeah, shout out to our Polish fans. We have a few of those. Yeah, apparently. 
I really want to go to Poland. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I guess I should you'd also be introduced. I forgot. Yes. Um, Who are you? I am Peter. Okay. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you and I are actually both uh, studying to become high school teachers. Or are, yes. are you studying for yeah. high school or middle school? I am also high school. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I technically am st- to just bore this conversation a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm studying philosophy and then I'm studying um, pedagogy on the side with teaching. So it's, mm-hmm. it's basically like a mixture. It's a double major type thing. So I'm studying, it's a lot of, what I'm doing is a lot of history. It's a lot of uh, classical philosophy mixed in. There's a lot of postmodernist philosophy in what I'm doing. A lot of Foucault uh, Bourdieu and a lo- it's it's basically like a type of meta teaching stuff that I'm doing too because a lot All of right. the philosophy is about what is a teacher like what does yeah. it mean to be a teacher that's definitely a big part of it too and mm. a lot of uh, a, a lot of history so technically when I'm done I should be able to teach philosophy history English and what else uh, political science right mm. political science I'm so. doing um, I'm doing social studies and history. For high school cool um, cool social studies is like i i actually don't know what social studies is like in other countries but in sweden social studies is like a catch-all for everything that is like you know it's like it's political science it's geography it's political history or like recent history and it's uh how to do your taxes and how to be well like what the fuck is democracy even and political ideologies and it's kind of a everything kind of subject like all all the humanitarian bullshit that no one else wanted to teach <laughs> oh that's interesting so also like ethics and morality and stuff yeah okay yeah we have a course that i think is widely misunderstood just called christianity some schools mm. choose to call it like religion but it's basically yeah. like it's um western ethics is basically mm. what it is it's basically like why isn't it okay to kill someone like why like how are you a good person all these big metaphysical and uh, humanitarian and ethical moral questions mm. that you explore and they start that class up i think from the third grade and it goes all the way up to the eighth grade um mm. where you just on you know at different levels explain to children like why it's basically like teaching children responsibility of others mm. in a sense so it's like, well, when you do this, it hurts her feelings or his feelings. Mm-hmm. And that's not good because if they did it to you, like just basically like uh, basic human kindness and stuff. Yeah, um, I would say that's, that's included that's in, in social studies. We also yeah. do psychology and philosophy in high school. But I no, we might do like, psych- oh God, uh, I think in middle school, actually, um, philosophy and psychology are included in social studies, hmm. uh, and then in high school they're split up into into different different subjects. I um, think philosophy is an elective in Denmark, but I don't know. I had de- it. It depends on what program you choose. To I think if you if you do um, the social studies program, then you have to do philosophy and psychology. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it is interesting uh, from just the philosophical aspect how most popular philosophy at the moment is heavily inspired by psychology yeah. or has very heavy, like have very heavy psychological influences. Like uh, people like Jordan Peterson and Slavoj Žižek are mm. both psychologists too. And they like mainly focus on the human mind aspect of ideology and yeah. Uh, happiness and 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 all these things, and I think I think that that's a a, f- a fairly good development in human psychology uh, and uh, philosophy because science doesn't really explain how we all think or how we all feel. We, it just explains the technicalities of the boundaries of the human mind. It doesn't mm-hmm. really explore the impact of society on the human mind. Hmm. I remember when I was in high school, we did. When we did philosophy, we, I felt like we most, like our teacher was really interested in like existentialism. Right. And, yeah. And like this, like how small we are, are we, we all are and like what even is consciousness and like 
what is it like the ship of theseus theory of like consciousness and like when you go to sleep, you technically lose consciousness, so when you wake up, are you the same person, or did you die in your sleep, and are you just, like, someone else with the same memories and that kind of shit? Mm. That's a lot of heavy stuff to lay on a bunch of depressed high school students, honestly. Yeah, that, that's, that's very heavy. Um, for, I remember I was really into existentialism around that time. I would listen to a lot of Joy Division and stuff, and because it's a very heavy period in one's life yeah. to go through in high school and then to find out about existentialism. Yeah. But I think ultimately it's 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 not it's not like a healthy a healthy way to live your life. That kind no, of intense no, self definitely uh, not. reflection. You want to get away from that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, you, we watched you... uh, an, an episode of Black Mirror in class. Actually, I remember we watched um, spoilers for Black Mirror season two or three or something. Um, it's the the episode where. When you die, your consciousness can be uploaded to, like, this virtual reality place. Oh, it's been so long since I've seen Black oh. Mirror, <laughs> but it does ring a bell. Yeah, it's episode four of season three, and it's called San Junipero. Okay. And essentially, the, the idea is that there's this system where, you know, your consciousness gets uploaded to, and you can live forever in a virtual world. And this virtual world is called San Junipero. Um, mm. And so we watched that in class, and essentially... We talked about, like, well, what does it mean? Like, is that actually you? Like, because the way it worked is, like, there was this machine that, like, created a digital copy of your brain and then put it on, on the server. I, I think I'm a bad philosophy student because I don't find that stuff particularly interesting. No, I actually, I got, <laughs> it's funny, I, like, I, uh, in my class, like, in my year, I think I was the favorite of my teacher in philosophy. I got a, when I graduated, I actually got a diploma from her that was like philosopher of the year or something. Oh, wow. Um, but I remember that in that class, basically all I did was I disagreed with her because I <laughs> took, <laughs> I took this like, um, hardline philosophical materialist stance. Okay. To, um, I can't, I can't, I wish I could remember examples, but I just remember like shut down all of her existentialism with just like hard materialists. <laughs> stances right right like but the question of is that you on when you when you wake up in the virtual world it's like no that's just a digital copy of you next question because mm. like it's not it, it's not actually your brain it's not your consciousness it's not you know it's not the same electrical pulses going through your brain it's not your body all it is is just a copy of you theoretically the copy of you and you could be alive at the same time and so when you die obviously your consciousness just doesn't get transferred to the digital copy because how the fuck would that even work and i thought that i was just being like a rebellious edgy student um but apparently she loved it yeah i think teachers just die for participation like you can say pretty much anything yeah. as long as you're contributing to the conversation you're making their lives much easier yeah i think so actually i think i think a lot of philosophy can be way too esoteric and uh completely inconsequential all of these mind quandaries about uh, what ifs and hypothesis and yeah. the implication of a moral decision that's hypothetical and I'm not I'm not into that type of stuff to be completely honest I don't I don't no, find that to be the really. interesting part of philosophy personally like I think yeah. yeah I think I think structural analysis deconstructionalism and um like may, maybe the more like political and um, mm. psychoanalytical por portion and postmodernist portion of philosophy way more interesting. I find that way more interesting. Um, the 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 bigger picture stuff, the sociological impact yeah. of society on the individual, I find more interesting. Yeah, I think like morally, philosophically, I'm like pretty pretty much a utilitarian. Um, mm. and like all of these questions of, oh, you can save five people but you have to kill one oh but you, you murder is wrong and so you shouldn't intervene like i just find that complete and utter bullshit it's not real philosophy that type of stuff i really i really believe so it's more like <laughs> i like most of ethics i find to be pretty bullshit to be honest yeah i can just imagine the comments on youtube now me saying that but like <laughs> ethics is is really just like uh it's 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 like those Reddit groups or whatever where they're like, "Would you do X if Y?" 
Yeah, it's just like it's it's like a, it's like a, 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 a very unsavory game to me. Like a a very like it's a way for you to to like brag about how numerically and mathematically superior you are <laughs> to to other people that you can explain why your decision is the only rational one. And it's just, it's boring to me. It's it's bo- It's like it's uh it's self heightening, narcissistic, boring stuff to me. Uh, I barely remember anything from high school. Both because mm-hmm. it's so long ago, but also because I, I just I was high most of the time, mm-hmm. and I was drunk, and I don't I don't I honestly don't I, I, my brain synapses have just closed that chapter <laughs> off of my yeah. life. I remember one day a guy was bragging about his iPhone. And I remember playing guitar another time, and that's it. Mm. I think. <laughs> For those who don't know, Peter is uh, fifty years old. Yeah, no, I'm 150 years old. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, but I am, I am old. I, I do turn 30 this year. So yeah, but and it it is fun for me to be like an an elder in this community to be like <laughs> yeah. a, as the millennial among Zoomers. I am very much a representative of what you have in store. <laughs> <laughs> you are all of our future. Yes, I am. I am the dire warning of yeah. <laughs> Of what's to come. So, kids, remember, if you don't work hard in school, you might just end up on a stupid podcast in your 30s. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Doing a double major in history and pedagogy. Philosophy, thank you very much. But yes. Well, you did history, too. Yeah, I'm also, yeah a lot of history, too. Yeah, that's true. And English? Yeah, and English, yeah. How many, how many things have you studied? Like, how many subjects have you done at <laughs> university? At the, oh my oh my uh, <laughs> you mean like independent of each other or right now independent like just total of all time oh my goodness uh let's see law english film uh public service mm. history philosophy and pedagogy yeah pretty much all right so i i'm good at nothing <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, you're a you're a renaissance man Exactly. Thank you. Yes, that's that's what I should go by, the Renaissance man. Yeah. Except you're like a mediocre Renaissance man. <laughs> I'm, like, yeah, I'm, yeah. You've studied the, everything but just a little bit. Yeah, I'm I'm the millennial Renaissance man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you are what conservatives in America warn will happen if college becomes free. Oh, oh my god, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you just get these these uh, students who just go around and study a little bit of this and a little bit of that, wasting the state's money and oh, never absolutely. working a productive day in their life. I feel like a right-wing Danish politician could walk into my door right now and film me and say, this is what the state does, <laughs> and yeah. that would suffice. <laughs> these are the consequences of Danish socialism. Yeah, pretty much. That's me. <laughs> uh, I am absolutely that. I am, yeah. You remember, did you see that thing that I think, what's her name, Nancy Reagan did about Denmark, where she said something like, uh, the young people, Denmark is Venezuela, and the young people, yeah. all they do is open up uh, cupcake stores or whatever. <laughs> I mean, like, I do I could, vaguely like, remember her saying that, yeah. Yeah, no, I could, if I sent her my biography of my life <laughs> up to this point, she would absolutely do a second story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Except this one would be true. I've basically done nothing in my life except be a student. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff, but yeah. I don't remember who it was, but some comedian said that the people who make video essays on YouTube are the people that really miss homework from high school. (laughs) I mean, I guess that's true then, because that is kind of what I do. Oh, I don't do video essays, really. I do like... For those who haven't seen my YouTube channel... By the way, if if you've found us on like Spotify or iTunes and are just listening to us randomly, hello. By the way, um, I do. I take like try to take these like complicated political concepts, like I don't, I don't fucking know North Korea and bias in the news and the Cuban democratic system and and a bunch of stuff like that, and then try to make it really simple and easy to explain and in like short videos. I don't know if I would call that video essays, but. I guess it's near. It's still like kind of in the same ballpark in a way because it's it's almost like you're giving yourself homework. Yeah. And hand, no, handing definitely. it in. Definitely, I am. Because for yeah. every every video that I make, 
I have to sit down and do a bunch of research. And often I like go to the library and I and I get books to read through to study the subject so that I because I, I always want to be 100% certain that I know what I'm talking about because I basically when Donald Trump was elected, people in America were constantly talking about Sweden, like, oh, Sweden is the rape capital of Europe and Sweden is socialist and, and it's terrible and everyone is unhappy and it's a chaos and it's wars in the streets and there are no go zones where the police refuse to go because it's so violent. And that essentially made me realize that, wow, I hate it when people talk about shit they know nothing about. And so I like made it a policy on my YouTube channel to never talk about a subject that I had not researched like intently and to not like have opinion or like to state my opinions on shit that I like hadn't actually looked into because Mm. I I just knew how frustrating it was for people to hear about something like like j- just being in a country and having people from other countries be like, yeah, I know exactly what's going on in that country over there. And then they just spread in misinformation. Like how frustrating that really is. It is really frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, it was like, it seems like culturally Trump's election was absolutely a point where a lot of people kind of, you know, woke up, especially in America, to the mm. ramifications of the policies of, you know, greater government. It's really interesting. I remember when we talked to American Johnson from Non-Compete, he said that your videos were like some of the OG leftist YouTube videos that he would watch when he was converting yeah. himself from someone who believed in liberalism and the liberal promise into someone who is now, I believe, like an anarchist or something. Yeah, anarchist. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. So you were, like, you were one of the people on the forefront of yeah. the what's now called BreadTube, I think, or left tube or i think he called me like the grandfather of bread tube then and you're like was what 20 years old and so- <laughs> <laughs> yeah the grand poppy azure yeah because my, my the video that i made was one of the first like left wing or like like amateur left wing youtube videos really yeah it was really like proto left tube because and, yeah. and like it's funny how how quickly it's become like a a viable media platform to have a leftist YouTube channel and what shape it's turned into. Because especially yeah. if you look at your very old videos, like the you had one where you ex- dis, uh, explained the differences between social democracy and Marxism and what the different yeah. types of Marxism really were, and it was it's that was really good first, and informative. Uh, that was my first video. Yeah, no, yeah, and and that I remember that's what like leftist YouTube videos were. But now you have these incredibly beautifully produced <laughs> almost like stage plays coming out from leftist YouTube. I do, I do like that you're implying that my video wasn't beautiful or well produced. <laughs> oh, it looked like shit, but it was effective. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being honest. <laughs> no, like I didn't I didn't put time into that video. I just made it so that I could have something to send it to people when I was arguing with them on Reddit about socialism. <laughs> because um I was really frustrated that when I was arguing with people I had to like repeat myself all the time like no, that's not what socialism is. Like this is what socialism is. This is the correct definition. And it's also just such a, a helpful thing when you think about it. Yeah. Like, I wish I'd have thought of that because you, you do get the same questions over and over again when you have, like, yeah. a, a public yeah. forum of any kind. It's always, like, the same. If, if you're a celebrity or if you're a politician or if you're whatever, it's, it's, it's helpful to have something to link to. But yeah. it, is, it is interesting to me how many people will interact with a creator and they will ask the same question after the creator has answered it a hundred times. Yeah. Like, if, if someone has a video called this is why socialism is good. People will mm. still comment on that video. Why do you think socialism is good? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's just YouTube. Like, I used to argue with a lot of people on, on the internet, uh, like, about politics, but I just kind of don't want to anymore. Yeah, I've also, like, yeah, I'm, I'm all raged out now, I think. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I, can't, I can't. It's, it's also, I think it's because it's the same discussion every time. Yeah, that it's just yeah. my brain just gives up because I feel like I'm. It's like you're yelling underwater if you keep yeah. having the same discussion over and over again and nothing ever changes. It's just it becomes like 
again, it's one of those things. You drive yourself crazy. You drive yeah. yourself crazy being a full-time researcher. You drive yourself crazy having the same online argument with people that you disagree with online. Yeah. It's like for my, for my own health, I kind of have like a detachment to online politics, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Like just, I, I don't like debates. I don't like having to explain myself all the time to people who are arguing in bad faith. And it's just, it's just ugly and it's not, like it doesn't do anything. Like you're not going to convince anyone. So no. It feels really pointless. And I think on that subject, I think you need to make a distinction between academics and people who are politically active. You do mm. have like a lot of people write theory about politics and theory about psychology and about the human mind, whatever. And those people don't write to have a discussion with you or to d prove anything to you or to change your mind. They write based off what they believe, what they've researched and contribute to a conversation. They, they're not asking for, uh, I would say most of them anyway, aren't really directly asking for a confrontation other than it's more, it's more like I have found this and therefore yeah. I'm going to publish it. That's one side of politics. And then the other one, you have the more polemic discussion part and people who, who are actively trying to change society. Yeah. I'm not the biggest fan of academia in general. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to politics, I, I, like, I enjoy talking to people in real life about politics because it's, it's a very different thing from talking like online and, and you're just typing and all you know, like you're talking to like some faceless entity on the other side. Right. Whereas in, when you're in person, you can have like a human conversation. Right. The person and is forced to recognize you as a human being. Yeah. And yeah. I, I feel like, like I'm obviously a leftist, but mm -hmm. I feel like in real life, I've met some like centrists and like liberals who have been way more agreeable than some other leftists that I've talked to online because just like people, some people just get nasty online and just rude and have weird takes and <laughs> shit. Like I, oh, I have plenty, I think most of my friends actually are like centrists or liberals and instead of leftists like me. Yeah. I, I'm very much the same. I no. think, yeah, I, uh, it's just, especially if you, if you, like uh, compared to what's going on with contrapoints at the moment, there's a lot of people who are being extremely rough on her and Lindsay Ellis and H bomber guy and all these leftist creators from from yeah. the left, like exclusively from the left that want to like. Yeah. If yeah. you read what they say on Twitter, they basically want to kill these people, and you just go like, "How oh, these? How can like what?" <laughs> yeah. It's such a, a contra. I actually really like contrapoints' newest video. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, no, I saw it, and I, 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 I like, I liked it, and I, I never really, I, I didn't actually understand what the drama was about. Like, I never actually knew what it was. Yeah. Um, but like you know, she explained it, and I thought, all right, that seems like a stupid thing to have a bunch of drama over. Um, but I think she, she actually made a point in the video that was like, um the LGBT community is way more hostile toward itself than the outside world tends to be. Yes. Like, straight people can be way less nasty to trans people than other trans people are to trans people. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that she tweeted that she also got into trouble for when mm. she, she tweeted that thing about how, um, as a trans person in... Oh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I have to be careful here. But as a, as a trans person, when you're in you know, uh, certain environments, you have to uh, constantly do uh, uh, pronoun circles and stuff like that where you, but, but then if yeah. you go to a straight place, everyone's just he or she, and it's just a, a more inclusive environment, I think she said, yeah. But yeah, mm. it's, I, think, I think you can absolutely take that line of observation and also just apply it to leftist spaces in general. Yes, leftist in fighting is definitely like a meme and like, oh, we need leftist unity. Like that is a meme that has, that we've talked about for years, but actually leftists are fucking terrible to each other. Especially online. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Especially like in real life, leftists 
I mean, it definitely happens that, that like leftists are fucking dickheads to each other. I think especially I was in, um, when I was more involved in like Leninist circles um, a few years ago, back when I was more, more of a tanky, um, like in the fucking old guys in the communist party were like dicks to each other most of the time. Um, I just they were just all like grumpy old men who never agreed on anything and called each other revis- revisionists and shit. Because that's what you do as a Leninist is everyone who you don't like you just call a revisionist and then that's how you win the argument. Um, and um, but like in, in more like d- younger circles like Sumers and more like you know democratic socialists and, and like. Soft Marxist, I guess, are the kind of people that I hang out with now who are leftists. Like, they are genuinely very nice people and very inclusive people. But online, leftists are dickheads to each other. And, and it's, I guess it's one of those things where it's like, uh, what is it? You like, you criticize the people you love or some shit like that? Like, it's oh, because, yeah, that like, old thing. It's not yeah. because you. Like, you're harsher against the people that you love or the people that you agree with because you are, like, disappointed in them and you want them to be better. Yes. Yeah. The scold the ones you love, I think the saying goes or something. You scold mm. the ones you love. But, yeah, no, it, it, but absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think another very good thing that, you know, it's funny. We even have to be, like, careful with uh, even acknowledging ContraPoint's existence at this point because the mob... Is yeah. so <laughs> virulent, uh, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I hope that's okay. Uh, but yes, yeah, I think she made a very good point about how a lot of online any politics really is extremely essentialist in its nature, and I yeah. never thought of it that way. But that's so true: is that there's so yeah, much yeah, yeah. essentialism in Definitely. in in these communities that it's like if you said something that I interpret to be homophobic racist uh, mm-hmm. uh against uh non-binary people then you are like you are for that statement yeah a transphobe yeah, yeah, yeah. a like racist she, um, she was like she said that, like <clears throat> um the discourse becomes it's not about what you did but it becomes what you are exactly so, yeah some I, I forget who who the she had an example of a, a guy who had said something that was like kind of transphobic I, I forget what he said or what context it was or who he even was but he said something which was transphobic and the discourse or like the drama went from he said something transphobic that he later apologized for to he said something transphobic to he is transphobic and then he it, it like escalated into like oh he's like a sexual predator and he's like uh, all these weird things and it's like so far removed from what the original event actually was yeah, it's and, like, it's it not all at all about yeah. like you are a terrible person and like no matter what you do, no matter what you say, you're just going to be a terrible person forever. Exactly. Yeah, there's there's no um there's no point where you're acceptable again. There's nothing no. you can do that won't just make you more suspect. Everything you've ever done, everything you've ever contributed with is now completely invalid and you are now completely out of the conversation as someone who has perhaps helped us or someone who has perhaps championed our cause. Which I yeah. think is, it's such a good observation and I wish I'd, I'd made it first. Uh, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably like, everyone's probably made that observation before me, but I mean, mm. it's, it's, I, I, mean, I absolutely agree. thought yeah, about it in, in similar, so I've, I've never really put it into words, but that is essentially like what drama is, and why I've always hated drama and stayed out of drama is because it just turns into this. Like, it doesn't matter what you do. It's not about the actual thing that you did. It just becomes this, like, circle jerk of hate. And, like, yeah. uncanceling is not a thing that happens. No, like Once no. you're canceled, people will hate you forever. And it doesn't really matter what you do or say anymore. Yeah, it's it's really vicious. And it's really scary how the people who are canceled are leftists. Like, there are other leftists. Mm-hmm. The people that leftists go after in these vicious campaigns are you know people who are prominent leftists like Zizek has been yeah. the recipient of it uh contrapoints has Lindsay ellis h bomber guy philosophy tube mia Mulder from sweden it's all these people that are attacked by people who uh are from this same community 
who used to support them, who've seen all the content that they've made that's actually helped their cause, and still, because of this one instance of something that they disagree with, they throw them under the bus. I, just, I, yeah. I think that's so sad, especially because uh, like a lot of the, the people from these communities are extremely exposed uh, based off of their relation to the alt-right or people who wish them harm. And yeah. the people that they thought were supporting them or, you know, in some way helping them um, stay, you know, relevant and uh, alive in a very divisive time can just turn on them from like one second to the next. And that must be yeah. extremely terrifying, especially if you're someone who like someone like let's take um, Oliver Thorne from Philosophy Tube, right? Yeah. He studied philosophy at, uh, a, from what I remember, like a good English university. But now, like, academics don't like him because he's a prominent, um, I guess you would call, like, a political commentator for a specific point mm -hmm. of view. So if he wanted to, he would have a hard time finding a job within his field in, like, a workplace situation because he's, he's now a known face of some political movement. Um, yeah. And, I mean, if you work in academia, for instance, I mean, they do hire people that are politically active, absolutely. But they also have to be careful not to be labeled as an institution that hires left-wing people or people who are polemic for whatever reason. So there are absolutely like a risk. There are risk-benefit factors to being a well-known public figure. And when you decide to make something that is potentially gonna like ruin your future career, it must be terrifying to 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 make content that is you know not only viable to offend the people that you disagree with, but also the people that you agree with and that you have to kind of tone police yourself all the time in what mm -hmm. you're saying and in, in your, not just your, your choice of words, but also your choice of like uh, examples that you use. Because like it, it, if you are barraged by the same people that went after contrapoints, you're, you're extremely vulnerable to incredible loss of, you know, both money, but also just like uh, influence and reachability. So like it's it's mm -hmm. it's pretty scary stuff. I think. I mean, like with the whole contrapoints drama, like what happened was like people were in the quote unquote mob were tweeting stuff like, "If you haven't blocked contrapoints, I will block you." And yeah, they were going after people who were like even mildly like they were going after Mia Mulder who didn't even know ContraPoints and oh, yeah, saying no. like if you don't like if you don't cancel ContraPoints if you don't distance yourself from ContraPoints you're going to be cancelled like everyone who's even like, like what's it called like the the what's it called when like you're removed from a person the the degrees of separation separation separated yeah. you from yeah like anyone who is like six to de six degrees six degrees separated from contrapoints is cancelled if they don't like immediately turn on her and are like I don't associate with her. Yeah, and it all hinges on these essentialist assumptions on contrapoints and Buck Angel and whoever else is included in this controversy. Mm -hmm. By now, it like I, I love uh, contrapoint said that you have to assume that Buck Angel is all of these things that you're accusing Buck Angel of in yeah. order to to like have that make ContraPoints a villain in this situation at all. Yeah. And by doing that, you're basically saying all of the stuff that Buck Angel did in the 90s and early 2000s in um, being like a positive role model and uh, inspiration to all these people in the trans community and non-binary community now uh, to, to, to dare to be who they are, all of that doesn't matter anymore because Buck Angel is so evil that anyone even remotely associated with Buck Angel is so contaminated with evil that you know you you can't possibly spread any goodness or any relevant stuff into the world from just from having done something with buck angel and i think that's an incredibly uh lame thing to do and think <laughs> like just yeah. to put it very simply like that's incredibly lame um and i get that a lot of the people who are very offended by this are people who have experienced discrimination and uh, live in places where they aren't accepted for who they are. But I just think it's incredibly sad to see all this energy and all of this frustration go into hitting someone who basically is on your side, who wants to see you do better, who wants to see you like 
have a better platform in this world when you could direct it at people on the other side of the fence like um richard spencer um <laughs> all of these like all of these people yeah. that legitimately don't recognize you for who you are whereas someone like contrapoints has made like what what did she say like a tenth of all her material is about how um like we should it's about non-binary yeah people. about non-binary and about how gender isn't this you know <laughs> solid thing yeah, yeah black and white thing yeah so someone who is actively championing your cause like that's yeah. incredibly depressing and sad for me uh, as someone who also uh participates in the discord online yeah. it's sad and like some like someone tweeted something like it's um it's such a shame that all of this content that contrapoints made before is uh, invalid now or it's like doesn't matter anymore now and it's like no, <laughs> like, <laughs> like even if even if Counterpoints was like did something really bad, like let's just pretend that Counterpoints did something like terrible, like just went full on hard R N word or something, right? <laughs> like, like, like even if Counterpoints was like justifully cancelled for doing something really bad, the content that she has made isn't invalid, like it's still a valuable resource. Yeah, that's an incredibly dangerous uh, historical revisionism that you have to do with everyone who's done anything problematic. And like, yeah. I've, ooh, I can't even imagine the horrific aspects and like impact that would have on society if we had to raise everything from society that didn't fit into our very specific ideological modern way of looking at history. That's, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. basically every fucking author, published author before the 1980s would have to be removed and it's also an incredibly un-marxist thing to do when you think about it like marxism champions the death of the author theory which is that once you've done something it's not it's no longer yours to change yeah or to yeah. have like an impact on it's the audience like we all own the thing that you create like yeah. if you, you can't I own mean, ideas you can't own, like in marxism doesn't believe in intellectual property in that same way or property in general <laughs> You, it, when you when you do that, when you say like you're invalid and all the stuff you created is invalid, you're not just yeah. saying this person has no rights anymore. You're also saying all the people that watched it and enjoyed it are now no longer allowed to do so and also no longer allowed to uh, watch it or do it. And I mean, in some cases, yeah. like I mean, from natural reason, like I personally don't feel comfortable really watching like Bill Cosby comedy just because yeah. like i i don't like i just, well, it's just i can't get it out of my head whenever i watch it like when i was young yeah. i would watch bill cosby's sh show and, and like his stand up and think that it was pretty funny but i mean now just because of the implication i personally choose to say i uh, i'll rather watch you know i'd rather watch something else but still yeah. i mean it's not it i still don't think it's problematic to watch bill cosby like if I someone don't think wants so to watch bill cosby i don't think it's like wow you are a terrible person for watching that or listening to michael jackson yeah or listening to michael jackson exactly like and i also don't think that we should shame people who now say that bill cosby was an incredibly important inspiration to them to be who they are now like we forget yeah. that in the 80s and early 90s the cosby show was like one of the only representations of african-american in popular culture and it was mm -hmm. the number one rated show in america like, and I mean, it, it must it was have been because like, of his massive influence and impact on people that it became such big news that he was like a terrible person. Yeah, and it should be discussed. Absolutely, I don't think that he, what he did was in any way acceptable. Don't don't misunderstand me. It's not acceptable yeah. what he did. But we also have to look at this stuff more in a more nuanced way. I think sometimes, and I think if we go full on like revisionism of history yeah. and and we can't just yeah. invalidate everything he ever did just because he was later. Like it later turned out that he was a bad person. Like he still did good things before that. Exactly. Yeah. Like bad people can sometimes do good things, and those good things are still good, even if they're done by a bad person. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. fucking uh, Donald Trump, when he went to to North Korea to try to make peace for the brief period of time when he tried to do that, like that was a good thing. Donald yeah, Trump that. trying to make peace with North Korea was a positive thing. Donald Trump is not a good person. I don't fucking stand Donald Trump. He still did a good thing when he tried when he went to North Korea and he entered North Korea to be the first US president to ever do so. And he shook hands with Kim Jong-un and he tried to make peace talks. He failed, but he tried and that was good. 
but fucking liberals came out and was like, how dare he try to make peace with this fucking dictatorship? And it's so terrible that North Korea is so terrible to its own people. How dare Donald Trump go to North Korea and shake hands with Kim Jong Un? He's in the he's in the pocket of dictators. He loves Putin and he loves Kim Jong Un. Mm-hmm. He loves dictators now, and and like. Just because it's Donald Trump doesn't mean that peace is now bad. Like, that really frustrated me when that happened. Because yeah. you have to separate the action from the person. Sometimes. You do. You do. And, and that's another thing. Like, I, I think liberal, uh, American liberal essentialism has also been extremely uh, clearly exemplified by the Trump presidency. Just mm. this, uh, I mean, everything Donald Trump does to Democrats is bad and is, yeah. is like immoral and the sign that he's a criminal and he's in the pocket of Moscow or whatever. Like, yeah. he, it doesn't... Even if what like, he does is like exactly the same thing Obama did. Yeah, exactly. Like, even if he's just continuing policies, it's somehow inspired by this Russian influence. And like, Trump has passed pretty severe uh, sanctions on Russia and somehow still, like, that is reported on as some kind of Russian <laughs> influence <Yeah. laughs> on him. And it's like, I'm not saying Donald Trump is a good president. I'm very scared at the moment because of the whole Iran thing. Uh, yeah. And I really hope that, you know, cooler heads prevail because it's really horrific. And I might know yeah. someone that might have gotten hurt. I haven't heard back from them yet, but I really hope that they're fine. Um, and uh, yeah, no, but but it's it's... It really is like an incredible example of um, just extreme, extreme essentialism that I think we kind of need to ease up on a little bit in some instances if we're going to, you know, do anything meaningful. Thank you to our patrons over on patreon.com forward slash Azure Scapegoat. You help us buy food and stay alive. You literally do. And I mean... If you d- like us or like want to, or, or hate us and want us to give you more stuff that you can hate, uh, <laughs> please send us money so we can keep doing this. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Joshua Cheeseman, OC Sabo Kitty, Dunk Junk Funk, Roland Balint, M Lim, Nian Chan Min, John H N, Eli Jedi Davian, Kva Graham, Gekobite. And Emil Sigerbeck. Thank you very much. You are wonderful people, and we really appreciate your help yeah. and contributions. Oh, um, I, you told me a story, or you, you told me that last time I sent you your half of the Patreon money that actually helped you buy a ticket to go see your family this Christmas. This is absolutely true. I forgot. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, uh, the money we made off of Patreon literally paid for me to be able to go back and celebrate Christmas with my family. So if that isn't wholesome 100, I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah. So if you're wondering what your money is going towards, it goes toward letting Peter see his family. <laughs> Bringing my family together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but I am, I am really touched by the donations and the contributions. And it literally, like, we have so, like, okay. So I guess this is like a... a tiny little secret or whatever but like we have so many fun ideas for what to do with this show and and where which direction it could go in and what we could do in the physical world and like the more contributions we get the more fun stuff we can do basically so yeah yeah i mean your money absolutely are going to a a, a good and important place for both of us and we would love to get more of your money so give us more of your money (laughs) If you if you have money to spare, yeah, yeah, please don't give us money if you're like in a tough place financially. No, no, I, I was also kidding. We don't we don't mindlessly want you to hand over money, but if you do have money, <laughs> we would greatly appreciate it. Okay, yes, that's enough hawking of our Patreon. I think. <laughs> I think that's enough. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you so much, and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>